Hi everyone. So today we're going to talk about what causes motion. So we're starting in the here, we're going to start talking about forces. So last unit we talked about kinematics, which described how something moves. Now we're going to move on to a topic called dynamics, and that describes why something moves. So just a little FYI, um, both kinematics and then dynamics, they make up the field of physics called mechanics. So if you take a mechanics class in high school, or excuse me, in college, you'll be taking, focusing on both of these subjects. Now, back in the 350-ish BC, Aristotle and his contemporaries thought about motion a lot. Um, and they concluded that the natural state of an object is to be at rest. Then in the 16th century, Galileo was thinking about motion and thought that their theory was a bit incomplete. So what Galileo, Galileo did is he further focused on an idealized case in which resistance to motion is zero. So that's to say that there's no friction or air resistance. So we can look at a, a similar thought experiment here to what Galileo was thinking. So if someone is um, sledding on the snow, on smooth snow, um, part A here you see a motion diagram of that situation. When this child is sledding on smooth snow, the sled soon comes to rest. But if they were sledding on a slicker surface, such as ice, their sled is going to go further. What happens if we keep making this um, surface slicker and slicker up to a point where there's no friction? Well, Galileo thought about this and realized that if friction could be reduced to zero, the sled would never stop. So he ended up concluding that the natural state of an object, um, its behavior free of external influences, is going to be uniform motion with constant velocity. Now, I'm sorry about my PowerPoint just now. Uh, that box was around uniform. I guess it moved when I went to presentation mode. But uniform means non-changing. And that box should be around uniform. So uniform motion with constant velocity. That's the natural state of an object. Now, these external influences that causes a deviation from uniform motion, these are what no, are known as forces. So forces cause um, the object to be in non-uniform motion. So we can summarize this, and it's what's known as Newton's first law. So consider an object with no forces acting on it. If it is at rest, the object will remain at rest. If the object is moving, it will continue to move in a straight line at a constant speed. So it will be in uniform motion. Now you can always think of it as Newton's first law, as an object in uniform motion, because if it's not moving, that's still uniform motion with a velocity of zero. That's equivalent. Now getting into forces, what is a force? Well, there's different ways we can define a force, and here is a list of characteristics of a force. So a force is a push or pull, and a force is always, always going to act on an object. We study a force by analyzing the object it's acting on. Um, a force requires an agent, that is to say something that acts or exerts power. Um, and the force is a vector quantity, so we have to specify its magnitude and direction. So here we have um, a picture of um, someone throwing, um, I guess that's shot put, I'm not too familiar with the uh, um, track and field, but they're pushing this ball and now be exerting a force onto the ball. So in this case, her hand is the agent providing a pushing force on the ball, which is the object we're analyzing. Um, here in this boxing match, we have this person's jaw being the object and this um, other person's hand being um, the force pushing on his jaw. So what causes, um, excuse me, what is a force? We can topically define forces in two main categories, into contact forces and long-range forces. So contact forces are probably what you think of when you think of a force. Um, that's a force that acts on an object by touching it at a point of contact. So for example, here on the right, we have um, a ball and a baseball, a bat, excuse me, a bat and a baseball, <laughs> um, and they're in contact and they're going to exert a force on each other. Now, um, 
a different type of forces are long range forces. And this is actually what I've dealt with the most so far in this class, if, um, only because we've discussed gravity and the force due to gravity and the acceleration due to gravity. But uh, the gravitational force is a long range force. So this is a force that acts on an object without physical contact. So here on the right, we have this mug free falling in the air. And it's being pulled down towards the Earth by the force of gravity. But gravity isn't actually touching it, so to speak. It's not in contact with it. But yet, it still causes the object to move, uh, causes the object to actually accelerate. So um, long story short, and this is actually a very important um, idea, AP really likes this idea right here, is that a force is an interaction between two objects. So it's an interaction. Now, how do we represent a, a force? Well, we're going to draw forces as vectors. So the first thing we're going to do is represent the object that the force is acting on as a particle. So whatever it is, a box, a ball, a bat, um, whatever is being acted upon by the force, we're going to represent as a particle. So all of its mass is just in one point. Next, what we're going to do is place the tail of the force vector on the particle. And then we're going to draw the force vector as an arrow pointing in the direction that the force acts. And remember um, that the length of the arrow should be proportional to the size of the force. And we also want to label this vector. I believe in the examples I have coming up, I believe I'm using word descriptions for an appropriate label. But as you'll soon see, we're going to use abbreviations and subscripts to define forces and label forces. So here I have some examples of drawing forces. One thing I want to note, especially if you're reviewing in this PowerPoint in the future, that this is not a free body diagram. I know we haven't learned what that is yet, but just if you're reviewing this before the test, these are not free body diagrams. These are drawings of how to draw a force. And I also want to note that in reality, there's going to be multiple forces acting on these objects we're analyzing, but we're just going to be practicing drawing one of these forces acting on the object. OK, so here we have the example of a box being pulled to the right by a rope. So in this case, the object we're analyzing, or the object that the force is acting on, is this box. Um, and the agent, so the object providing the force, or the thing providing the force in this case, is the rope. Um, so what we do is we draw the box as a, a particle. Um, we're going to draw the force vector starting with the um, tail on our object, and we draw the force vector in the direction of the force. So in this case, the box is being pulled to the right. It's failing a pull to the right. Um, so our vector is going to be directed to the right. And we have to draw the force with the proportional size, uh, but it, because we don't have other forces going on here, that's kind of a moot point. Um, but when we draw free body diagrams, again, I know I don't know what that term means, but we will learn it. Um, we're going to have to make sure that proportionality idea is in use. And actually, we'll see that at the end here in the example. Um, so here, in this example, we have um, a box being pushed to the right by a spring. So in this case, our object is the box, and the spring is our ancient agent, and it's providing a pushing force that's to the right. So here, even though the um, agent is on the left, it's providing a force that acts towards the right. So if we... Um, draw the situation, we have a force vector that's pointing to the right. Now we can also draw force vectors for long range forces. So in this case we have a box in free fall. Um, so um, the agent in this situation is actually Earth because Earth is providing this gravitational force. Um, so the box is the object and it's being pulled down towards Earth by the long range force of gravity. So we have draw a force vector pointing straight down at the force due to gravity. Now because forces are vectors, we can combine them. Um, so here on the right, we have a box being pulled by two ropes um, at, um, at different angles. Now when several forces are acting on an object, we're going to find it very helpful to combine these forces as if it was just one force acting on it. We're going to call this a net force. Um, so uh, when forces combine, 
they form a net force given by what's called the vector sum of all the forces. All right, so that's to say that our net force mathematically can re be represented with this summation symbol. Um, but if you're unfamiliar with this notation, that's okay. It's the same thing as saying we're going to add the first force to the second force to however many forces there are, are until we're done with all the forces that are acting on the object. Now we call this here, this mathematical summation of, um, of vector quantities, this is called a superposition. So in this case, we're creating a superposition of forces. Now coming back to this example, if we draw um, a diagram of these two forces acting on our box, the box is represented by our particle here, we've got one force acting in the direction of this rope here, so that's this vector here. We've got another force acting um, in our direct downward direction here, um, that's represented by this force. Since this problem doesn't give us what the magnitude of these forces are, or their strength, um, um, we've assumed here that their lengths are going to be proportional. Now, if we draw um, the resultant vector, so we could add these vectors tail to tip, um, or in this case here, this is what's called the parallel parallelogram method of adding vectors. Either way is fine. Um, if we want to draw a tail to tip, we have a first vector here. We can draw F2 along this dotted line here, and we see we get the same resultant vector. So in a sense, we could draw, instead of drawing our two vectors here, we can, re we can represent it mathematically as one resultant vector, a net force vector, in this direction here, and with this size. So that vector there is the same thing as adding together force 1 and force 2. An important thing to note is that this net force is not a new force um, that's acting in addition to those forces. Instead, we should think of it as the original force being replaced by this net force. Right, so it's not another force in addition to these others, it's a new force instead of those forces. And another thing we'll note is because we're dealing with the vector sum, we're going to make it easier on ourselves by breaking our vectors down into x and y components and sum each separately. Kind of like we did in kinematics, um, we dealt with the horizontal direction and the vertical direction. Uh, even though technically we could have done it just vectorially, we're going to do the same thing here because it's going to make the math simpler and easier to solve. So one last thing I wanted to talk about, and I kind of referenced this example earlier. So we have a situation here, um, and this question tells us that the net force on the object points to the left. So we know when we add up all our forces, it's going to result in a vector that's pointing straight to the left. Um, two of the three forces are shown, so that's in this diagram here. So we have two forces here, we're missing one of them. We want to choose which of these three is the missing third force. So you guys take a moment, think about it, and then come back here and we'll talk about what the answer is. So the answer is going to be the third of these vectors. And the reason why is we know our resultant vector is going to be pointing straight to the left. And that's the case, we know that our vertical components have to cancel out. So because we have a force pointing straight up, we don't want our resultant vector to be having any up part at all. So we know that we're going to have to have a piece of vector pointing straight down. Right, and force 3 here provides a length in the vertical direction that's the same as the length of force 1, so the same magnitude. Now when it comes to the horizontal direction, we uh, want the um, vector component pointing to the left to be longer than the component pointing to the right. So if we look at the lengths of F2 here and the horizontal component of F3, we'll see that this component here is a little bit longer than this one, which means that we'll have um, a leftover force that's pointing straight to the left, and that's going to be our net force. All right, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you very much.